Good morning or good evening if you're joining us from the, uh, the UK. My name is Gabriel Meyer, the Executive Director of the Historic Ruskin Art Club here in Los Angeles. And we're delighted to welcome you wherever you are. Um, this is the last program of our uh, spring season. We'll be back in August and we've saved what I believe will be one of our best and most remarkable programs for last. The first time I met uh, Dr. Sandra Kemp was actually at Brentwood on the terrace uh, overlooking Lake Coniston in the summer of, uh, of 2018 at Ruskin's estate, where we discussed the challenges of preserving and housing the White House collection of Ruskin drawings, correspondence, and other documents at Lancaster University's Ruskin Center, where she serves as director. A year later, I had the pleasure of seeing Sandra again at the Bicentennial Conference on Ruskin held at the Huntington Library in, in San Marino, California, where she fascinated us all with a talk on Ruskin's extraordinary and little known scientific drawings in the Lancaster University collection. And again, at a conference on Ruskin and the Anthropocene at Notre Dame University organized by professors Robert Goulding and Sarah Maurer in February, 2020. Uh, Robert Goulding will take the reins this morning in just a moment. Of course, we couldn't have known it then, but the 2020 Notre Dame Ruskin Conference was the last event many of us attended before COVID uh, remade our world. So it's uh, especially lovely today as we all take first looks outside our pandemic foxholes that we're, uh, that we're together again. I'm gonna turn things over now to uh, Dr. Robert Goulding. Uh, Robert Goulding is the director of the Riley Center for Science, Technology and Values at Notre Dame University. He grew up in New Zealand and studied classics and mathematics at university there then moved to London for a master's and PhD at the Warburg Institute in London, an institution that brings together the visual and cultural study of the Renaissance. His own research specialty focuses on science and mathematics in Elizabethan England. And also his, re his more recent research uh, specialty uh, is an interest in optics and the science uh, of illusion. In addition to directing the Riley Center, uh, Robert is um, uh, teach, teaches in the undergraduate Great Books Program of Liberal Studies, where he says he has the opportunity from time to time to teach some of Ruskin's essays. So without further ado, Robert Goulding. Thank you so much, Gabriel. It's a great honor to be asked to introduce Sandra and to be part of the, the Ruskin Art Club. Um, it's a cliche to begin introductory remarks by saying that the speaker needs no introduction. In this case, however, it would be entirely accurate. As a custodian of John Ruskin's visual and literary legacy, Professor Sandra Kemp is surely known to everyone attending an event of the Ruskin Art Club. Professor Kemp came to what was then the Ruskin Library, now rechristened the Ruskin, after a distinguished curatorial career at the VNA, the Royal College of Art, the Smithsonian, and the Universities of Oxford, Edinburgh, and Glasgow. Under her directorship and creative vision, the Ruskin has staged illuminating exhibitions on John Ruskin at the meeting point of the arts, sciences, criticism, and what we might call the prophetic spirit. Her first exhibition at the Ruskin was entitled The Museum of the Near Future, and has set the direction of the institution under her guidance, and it also provides the title for today's lecture. While her scholarly work and curatorial vision are founded on profound historical understanding and meticulous regard for objects and artifacts in their contexts, her John Ruskin and the Ruskin itself speaks to us as our contemporary, engaging both with modern arts and design and with our current concerns. Her own research shows a continuing concern with the human experience of the future and of time itself as expressed in fields as diverse as the arts, economics, and nanotechnology. As one entered that first exhibition at the Ruskin, one encountered the words, 
look closely, see clearly, imagine freely. Throughout the Ruskin bicentennial year, we were repeatedly reminded in exhibitions, books, and articles of Ruskin's insistence that the first, and in some ways the last, stage in the moral life was simply to see, or as he put it even more grandly, the greatest thing a human soul ever does in this world is to see something and tell what it saw in a plain way. Now, those of us who have read some Ruskin know that this is hardly his only moral admonition. In fact, there is scarcely a page of Ruskin's writing that does not chastise the reader and urge him or her to act and to be better in everything from their public life to domestic economy. It was precisely this unrelenting moral seriousness, the Old Testament prophetic vein of Ruskin's character that led a disillusioned post-Victorian generation to reject him so thoroughly. Ruskin's moral voice is coming back into fashion, but it is interesting that in the 2000s, his insistence that we should see has been particularly re resonant. Our world perhaps has come once again to mirror Ruskin's own. In our technological age, it has become as difficult to see nature as it was in Ruskin's industrial age. And if Ruskin railed against those who failed to see injustice in the early days of free market capitalism, now in late stage capitalism, it is all too easy to look away from the suffering upon which prosperity and comfort are built. Today, Sandra will be exploring from an interdisciplinary or polygonal perspective, the theme of representation and seeing in Ruskin's work, among much else. Her paper is entitled, John Ruskin and the Museum of the Near Future. Please join me in welcoming Professor Sandra Kemp. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to um, share my screen. Sorry, just having some. Great. Um, Um, so it is um, an enormous pleasure to be here and um, thank you to Gabriel, to the Art Club and to Robert for such a, a warm welcome. Um, we're now um, accustomed to what in this case is truly um, a coffee and cocktails, depending where you are, um, session. And um, it's a great pleasure to see in the audience, numbers of people who've visited um, the Ruskin or who work on Ruskin themselves. Um, as Robert said, this invitation um, came following um, the presentations during the bicentenary. And Robert asked if I would, I'm just going to go back here, if I would in particular follow up to show more of the Ruskin White House collection. As you may know, at the moment, we're using this period of lockdown to um, renovate the building. And while we're doing that, we've been able to digitize and look at and work on some parts of the collection which have not been much worked on before. Um, so I'm taking as my starting point today, some of the stunning scientific drawings from the notebooks and diaries, some of the lecture diagrams, which we've recently started a program for conservation, um, and some of the notebooks, including what Ruskin called his studies on the spot, sketches and drawings in his diaries and notebooks, to look at his work in the context of science alongside his scientific contemporaries. Um, as, as Robert said in uh, his introduction, we relaunched the Ruskin in 2019 as a university museum, and we renamed it Museum of the Near Future. Um, we made a pitch to say that we would work on this collection to demonstrate the importance of Ruskin's work, not only for his own time, but for our time, looking at the contemporary relevance of Ruskin's emphasis on plural repertoires of knowledge and the interplay 
of scientific knowledge and social and cultural value. We argued that this collection, um, we, we fundraised to purchase it so it wouldn't be split up, sold on ever. It's now in legal charge um, of the government beyond the university. Um, and the collection offers the basis now for using Ruskinian materials in thinking as a springboard for addressing ongoing social, cultural and environmental issues. As Gabriel said, we couldn't see at that point that um, obviously we were about to enter a pandemic, but I think this view of um, rethinking the museum, library, and research centers remit, reach, and scope after and during the pandemic with Ruskin as a catalyst to rethink our relationship to the world on many fronts is even more timely now. As you know, Ruskin um, was one of the great visionaries of the 19th century with an extraordinary ability to connect art, science, and society. As an early adopter of optical technologies in his works, he used the latest scientific methods and technologies to investigate mountains, clouds, geological formations, to assemble important geological collections, and to draw, amongst other things, glacial landscapes. The, um, the lead image for my presentation is the iconic daguerreotype of the Mer de Glass, taken by, um, created by Ruskin and Frederick Crawley in 1854. Six years previously, in 1849, um, Ruskin and his uh, another assistant, John Hobbs, created what was the first, as they called them, sun portrait ever of the Alps. Many scientists, their scientific contemporaries, were also alpinists and mountaineers. And I wanted, as, um, as a way to focus thoughts uh, for this presentation, to start um, with the Matterhorn, to start with the, the powerful, uh, this powerful image and the powerful effect, as Ruskin said, the effect of this strange Matterhorn upon the imagination is so great that even the greatest philosophers cannot resist it. Here is a photograph from the glass slide negative collection, which is one of the things that we've recently um, had the wonderful luxury to digitize during this period of packing up and have found some extraordinary new um, photographs, both of Venice, um, happy snaps in a way of Ruskin and family members and visitors at Brentwood, and of architecture. Um, but um, drawing on these collections, and I'm just going to go back um, to this image, I wanted to start by focusing on um, the an aspect of, of Ruskin that may be less familiar to some of you, these extraordinary line scientific drawings in a number um, of his publications. Um, and I wanted to um, start by connecting these two drawings. On the left-hand side is Ruskin's drawing of called Cloud Perspective, Curvilinear of the Clouds, from Modern Painters, Volume 5. And next to it is Ruskin's nemesis, the physicist John Tyndall's um, beautiful um, drawing of um, interference spectra of, um, from the glaciers. Um, I want to start um, with Ruskin's drawing. This is one of a series of diagrams used to illustrate the geometric compositional rulings in drawing curved shapes. In particular, the application of perspective to the depiction of clouds. Ruskin believed that a firm grasp of the rules of proportion and perspective was necessary to capture the expression of buoyancy and space in sky. These drawings bring together his core principles of intense observation, 
he believed to be inherent to both scientific thought and artistic expression. And to get to you um, behind the artist's eyes, to his thoughts, I just wanted to read a description of, by Ruskin, of what he calls the true cumulus. The true cumulus, the most majestic of all clouds, and the only one which attracts the notice of ordinary observers, is for the most part windless. The movement of its masses being solemn, continuous, inexplicable, a steady advance or retiring, as if they were animated by an inner will or compelled by an unseen power. They appear to be peculiarly connected with heat, forming perfectly only in the afternoon and melting away in the evening. Their noblest conditions are strongly electric and connect themselves with storm cloud and true thunder cloud. Next to it, Tyndall's interference spectra from his book, Glaciers of the Alps, is from his work on the origin and phenomena of glaciers with which he and Ruskin um, uh, had very different views and an exposition of the physical published in 1860. Tyndall's description of the action of intense light upon the eye accompanying this illustration is as follows. And in putting ourselves in the headspace uh, of Ruskin and Tyndall, um, think of this as scientific description from this book. For a long time, we were in the cool shadow of the mountain, catching at intervals through the twigs in front of us, glimpses of the sun colored by colored spectra. Once the orb appeared behind a rounded mass of snow, which lay near the summit of the Aigui du Midi, looked at with naked eyes, it seemed to possess a billowing motion, the light darting from it in dazzling curves, a subjective effect produced by the abnormal action of the intense light upon the eye. As the sun's disk came more into view, its rays, however, still grazing the summit of the mountains, interference spectra darted on it from it on all sides and surrounded it with richly uh, gloried, richly coloured bars. Um, like many Victorians, Ruskin became deeply illusioned with what he increasingly considered to be the divorce of science from religion, with science's utilitarian outlook and its destructive environmental impact. And his essay, Storm Cloud of the 19th Century, outlining perceptions of changes in cloud properties and shifts in climate, is one of the earliest publications on climate change. Contemporary scientific views on the environment are becoming perhaps more aligned with Ruskin's, which were ridiculed by his contemporaries as, quote, imaginary or insane. So this, um, these two images we have here and today's presentation are part of what's going to be an exhibition um, that I've curated with the head of collections at the Royal Society in London, one of um, our oldest scientific um, learned societies and institutions, drawing on the collections of the Ruskin and the Royal Society to consider Ruskin's works alongside of his scientific contemporaries. This is, um, the big, this is part of three research projects currently underway at the Ruskin. Um, the first is um, a project between Edinburgh University, Cambridge University, and the Ruskin at Lancaster University, bringing together the collections of Ruskin, the geologist, the geologist uh, Lyle, and um, Charles Darwin. This second one is looking at the notebooks of a number of physicists, particularly uh, physicists who worked on mountains and clouds, uh, who were Ruskin's contemporaries at the Royal Society. And the third, um, uh, the next iteration of this work that's looking in particular at the scientific aspects of our collection, will be um, a touring exhibition that is in development at the moment 
um, that will hopefully, pandemic permitting, um, come to a small version Notre Dame next year, and then gather works and um, perhaps travel, uh, certainly in the States, and then we'll come back to the UK for an exhibition, a large exhibition um, in London in three years time. The way that the um, themes that we're looking at in these joint transcription projects of Ruskin, Lyle, Dar Darwin, notebooks, Ruskin, and uh, connections with diaries, notebooks, and letters in the Royal Society, um, we're looking at this in three ways. First, visually, the primacy of observation and experimental image making, as you can see in these slides here, using new scientific instruments and new optical technologies, such as the daguerreotype, across the arts and society and sciences. And the question here underpinning this, Ruskin's question, but a research question for the exhibition is, are new modes of thought and expression made possible through the, through the visual? Ruskin described his drawings as, quote, syllables of thought, a way of seeing and understanding the world across the porous boundaries of observation and expression. That across the arts and the sciences, what links these new ways of thinking and representing are forms of visualizing. Um, to go on here now to another um, dimension um, powerfully to make us see as part of Ruskin's work. Here um, are parts of the collection which uh, we have 40 four of these. These are enormous large scale diagrams. Um, the, this is, will give you a sense of the scale of them in our launch exhibition. They're about um, four foot by six foot, which were um, used to illustrate Ruskin's lectures. And um, these ones here on the left to illustrate um, uh, a lecture on, on, um, on ornithology and on the right, the tree twig lecture that Ruskin, uh, we have four of the um, beautiful uh, diagrams from, from this lecture in the collection. Um, so for Ruskin, visual depiction is at the heart of inquiry and instruction. The teaching of art is the teaching of all things, he said, and the conceptual leverage of forms of vis visualization is crucial for him, as is the knowledge making capacity of objects and of the material culture and the world around him. In the exhibition, um, coming next to material culture, and the taxonomies of the collector. Um, we have here from the launch exhibition, a loan of um, some of uh, Ruskin's extraordinary geology collection from Brentwood, uh, where the collection is now, the full collection is on display in the treasury there. When um, travel opens up again, I would urge you to visit this beautifully curated and displayed and um, the research potential of the collection um, is, is extraordinary. Um, for the exhibition, for the science, Ruskin and science exhibition, and Ruskin himself, we're asking the question, what is the knowledge making capacity of material things? And at the time, how was Ruskin and how were scientists what kind of range of probes to elicit information and the material qualities of natural objects and forms, such as rocks, mountains, and clouds, were they using? And thirdly, um, the visual, then first, secondly, the material. Thirdly, um, 
we're really looking at the combination and the extraordinary inexplicable intertwinedness of Ruskin, um, in Ruskin, of word and image. Um, Robert referred to it um, in his introduction, and this is that unique conjunction of poetry and science, words as catalysts for ideas, mythologies, philosophies and visions, combining technical, evidential and past-based inquiry with that beyond the reach of factual and empirical novel that makes Ruskin so unique and um, often cause such conflict with his scientific contemporaries. Um, I'm just going to read you along with this um, beautiful uh, drawing of these two stones from one of the notebooks, Ruskin's um, repost to a student who made the mistake of saying in a drawing lesson that he thought he knew how to do a stone and wanted to proceed to something a bit more difficult. And Ruskin replied, this is in the elements of drawing, a stone may be round or angular, polished or rough, cracked all over like an ill-glazed teacup, or as united and broad as the breast of Hercules. It may be as flaky as a wafer, as powdery as a field puffball. It may be knotted like a ship's hawser, or kneaded like a hammered iron, or knit like a Damascus sabre, or fused like a glass bottle, or crystallized like hoar frost, or veined like a forest leaf to look at. So don't try to remember how anyone told you to do a stone. So starting from this point then, the visual, the material, and the verbal, I'd like to think that Ruskin is othering seeing, that this was an age of revolution in travel, communications, technology, and science. And Ruskin described the need, I think beautifully, for, I quote, the perceiving eye to be stretched out like a four-cornered sheet. So what lies behind Ruskin's cognitive and communicative practices? And how does this, what does he bring from this to science and get from science? Um, when I was talking with Gabriel about preparing this presentation, I said that the more I work on Ruskin, the more I think that uh, in some ways thinking about Ruskin can be encapsulated in Wittgenstein's, Wittgenstein's words when he said, we don't find the business of seeing puzzling enough. And I'm using this as my cross-cutting theme across the visual, material, and verbal dimensions to examine Ruskin in the context of science through the lens of the works in the Ruskin White House Corner co collection in order to demonstrate its extraordinary contemporary relevance, how and why he brought science to art and vice versa. There's another beautiful rock drawing. And um, here um, I'm thinking about in terms of othering, seeing and thinking questions of identity and self identity. This beautiful daguerreotype you can see um, thrown into visual perspective by the chalet or the little house at the bottom. The questions of the place of the human being in the world. I think Ruskin was very much considering notions of the value of the collection and the archive. He was a great collector of shells, rocks, a number of other things. And it's fascinating to see the way he assembled his museum at Walkley, which in itself was a new way of thinking about how we might look at objects and collections. And Throughout his works, um, and again, this is another stunning uh, photograph in the collection, Ruskin was um, working to deterritorialize time, partly through the advent and his work in and on geology. He was constantly through his work, 
unpacking the past into different presents. And um, one of the things that um, his writings and a number of his uh, sketches and drawings constantly do lucidly um, is to explore the awareness of the permanent, permanent when addressing the momentary in a way that was probably more modernist uh, than Victorian. He was constantly asking how people expressed new ways of thinking, how we divide up and classify our world, how we gather and present meaningful um, data. But he was of the view and um, didn't budge from this view that knowledge was experiential and that science was inherently part of culture. And um, for example, um, despite his, um, and we're going to look at some of these in a minute, um, accuracy, precision, and technical knowledge, his persistent belief was, and I quote, no science of perspective or anything else will enable us to draw the simplest natural line accurately unless we see it and feel it. Um, in packing up the collection, we came across a number of uncatalogued um, drawings um, very, this is one example which has previously been catalogued, but the ones that we came across have a wonderful um, sensuality and freedom and flow um, that's curiously abstract sometimes, but always highly kinesthetic. He quarreled with scientists who he believed were constantly engaged in the maintenance of some theory or other gathering material to support it. Um, but he veers between the two perspectives. So on the one hand, he um, and co and often contradicts himself in this respect. On the one hand, he says, I quote, in Modern Painters, I was quite sure that if I examined the mountain anatomy scientifically, I should go wrong, but elsewhere, a few pages later, he says, a landscape painter's ignorance of the science of the earth was on, would be unpardonable. Therefore, he says, on the one hand, I closed my geological books and set myself to see the Alps. On the other hand, he is constantly reading and studying and corresponding uh, theoretically and applying much of this knowledge in, in his works. Um, we found some uncatalogued letters um, uh, relating to scientific um, material that also hasn't been catalogued in the Royal Society. So we have a very uh, a potentially new body of correspondence relating to the glacier debate of the time. Um, here are some other examples, just um, wanted to use this uh, as a luxurious uh, way of being able to show you uh, works that you probably wouldn't previously have seen from the collection. Again, thinking about line and perspective and portrayal of the natural world. Now, Ruskin called these sketches on the spot and um, these line drawings were quick uh, sketches, unfinished often. He, uh, elsewhere, he called them syllables of thought, mere hints of what I want to do or say. And rather beautifully, elsewhere again, little patches and scratches of the sections and fractions of things. Here you can see it's a, a very faded, very um, pencil uh, manuscript, but Ruskin's note at the bottom, sketch on the spot, 1821. Um, in his letter to his father, in a letter to his father in the 1840s, um, he wrote, um, and I think this really brilliantly describes this um, memoranda type way 
of uh, doing drawings. He actually, uh, throughout his uh, mountain diary, which is full of these gorgeous, um, simple line sketches of the mountains, uh, he calls them memoranda for thought. And um, he writes to his father, trying to capture Mont Blanc before disappearing in the mist. I quote, after consulting my pulse, I unpacked my sketchbook, sat down to rest under a stone and made a memorandum, which I did not touch thereafter, as I fancy few artists can show a careful sketch in color made at 8,000 feet above the sea when suffering a violent sore throat. And I think something of the tone and the um, effect that Ruskin uh, achieves through some of these um, unfinished quick sketches um, could, could be or could relate to something that the artist Frank Auerbach said at the opening of one of his own exhibitions um, in 1978, talking about um, his own work and perceptions of unfinishedness uh, in, in his body of work. And he says this, what I'm hoping to do, what I'm not hoping to do is to paint another picture because there are enough pictures in the world. I'm hoping to make a new thing for the world that remains in the mind like a new species of living thing. A new species of living thing, these tiny thought pieces, these tiny sketches, or as the poet Ezra Pound described an image, an intellectual or emotional complex in an instant of time. And um, Ruskin's sketches, and I think what he's striving again and again in these pieces to do is to describe and to capture the um, uniqueness and the essence of the things that he's drawing or sometimes um, doing quick uh, watercolor sketches of. Um, in 1853, when he was lecturing in Edinburgh and I was um, packing up um, the lecture diagrams and I found uh, attached to one of the lecture diagrams, a letter that hadn't been um, opened before and we accessioned it and uh, added it to the collection. And it's another uh, version of things that uh, Ruskin has said many times elsewhere about um, the, the difference between things that look in, in theory uh, identical. But here he's gone to give this lecture and he's recounting how he's been in Edinburgh and he's passed 678 identical windows in the street where the lecture was being held. He says, they were absolutely similar and altogether devoid of any relief by decoration. But then he goes on to say, you will answer me when we see sunrise and sunset and violets and roses over and over again, and we do not tire of them. And answering his own challenge then says, did you ever see one sunset like another or two violets or roses that were entirely alike? And um, this notion of um, staying for the moment with modes of visual observation for a while, this notion of a new thing for the world when considering the claim to embody new knowledge um, was of course um, in partly driven um, and we can see it across art and science by the birth of photography as an exciting and experimental medium pioneered by the likes of Louis Daguerre and Henry Fox Talbot um, Ruskin was, as we know, um, an early practitioner 
using the technology to capture Venetian architecture and alpine scenes and glaciers, as well as amassing one of the foremost collections of daguerreotypes or sun drawings, as he called them. Simultaneously, natural and mechanical, these photographic technologies troubled long-term, long-held assumptions about the relationship between art, nature, and religion. Um, in the Royal Society collection, we've been looking at Fox Talbot's earliest uh, photographs and writings about these, which hailed the photogenic drawing as the pencil of nature and the, the correspondence reflecting the disbelief and the ways in which Talbot had to clarify that the images had indeed made, been made, I quote, without any aid, whatever, from the artist's pencil. Um, amongst um, Ruskin's daguerreotypes uh, of the Alps, and these really earliest known images of the Alps in the world, Ruskin proclaims himself to be astonished by the accuracy of its detail, the extraordinary potential of its ability to render gradations of light and line for both science and art. But later, he deplored its mechanistic effects because of this direct loss of sensory connection with what we see. And in 1868, he wrote to the photographer Julia Margaret Cameron that he'd lost interest in photography and instead offered a bold challenge to science, the possibility of painting with sunlight. He wrote, no chemist has yet succeeded to do this. And one of the things I've been doing with um, Keith Moore, who's head of collections and archivist at the Royal Society, is looking at the lesser known correspondence between Ruskin and some of the earliest um, proponents of daguerreotype photography of, uh, for the purposes of astronomy, of lunar um, and sun landscapes. Because along with other scientists and artists of the days, Ruskin was experimenting all the time with the art of the photogenic um, devices, such as the daguerreotype stereoscope, but also the camera lucida, the microscope, uh, and the telescope in order to um, explore the potential for this seeing clearly or intensity of sight that his, was his lifelong um, quest and vision. The great exhibition in 1851, Ruskin remarks on the earliest known image of a lunar daguerreotype by John Adam Whipple, which won one of the um, gold medals for uh, technological achievement of the moon. This in turn had a profound influence on the astronomer Warren de la Rue, um, who was a strong advocate for astronomical photography and science. And it was um, Warren de la Rue's um, lecture on the solar eclipse was the only time that Ruskin attended the debates at the Royal Society in London. But again, there's a very interesting unpublished correspondence um, about these sunspot um, notebooks. Um, so here we have uh, Warren de la Rue's observatory sunspot notebook. Um, and this technology, it's another optical technology, um, was designed by de la Rue in 1854 and it records the measurements of the sun and sunspots. Um, the development of this photoheliograph technology resulted in scientific um, breakthroughs made at the astronomy, um, at the observatory at Kew on, um, on the understanding of the sun and in particular of the influence of magnetism on um, sunspots. 
This was the first apparatus to photograph astronomical bodies and phenomena. Um, this is Delarue's photograph of the total solar eclipse. Um, and um, in which he presented in a lecture that Ruskin attended and wrote um, fulsomely about in his diary and notebooks in 1862. Um, Delarue was a chemist and an inventor along with an astronomer, and he was um, most but, but best known for his work in astronomical photography. In the lecture, he used diagrams, models, and projected these photographic images of the eclipse on a screen using the photoheliograph he developed himself. Ruskin, as we know, was also an accomplished lecturer who used these models, large-scale diagrams, choreographing their display to maximum effect, as for example, in his um, lecture, The Storm Cloud of the 19th Century at the Royal Institution in 1884, where he produced a dazzling cloudscape by projecting drawings enhanced with luminous color paint onto the interior of the lecture theater. Ruskin and, and De La Rue, um, here, here we have, sorry, here we have a uh, painting actually uh, by Arthur Seven, um, watercolors to be engraved as illustrations for the publication of the Storm Cloud Lecture after a series of cloud studies uh, produced by Ruskin, which document the changing atmosphere he saw resulting from increased industrialization. His work was part of growing awareness in the 19th century of the ways that human activity could directly affect the atmosphere and the earth. And with um, De La Rue and Ackland uh, and Tyndall, um, the physicist John Tyndall, whose experiments uh, set out to demonstrate why the, why the sky is blue, there are a series of really fascinating notebook exchanges on the best way to present these phenomena. Here are some more uh, from our collection of these amazing uh, cloud drawings. Um, this is the signing in on the right hand side of the slide of Ruskin and Ackland at De La Rue's um, lecture and Ruskin and Ackland was fellow students at Oxford and although primarily uh, a medical specialist, Ackland was a competent artist. And Ruskin and Ackland were part of a group of scientists and artists, including an architect, Benjamin Woodward, stone carver, Theo Shays, the geologist, John Phillips, and the chemist, Charles Dabonet, who established the Oxford University Museum of Natural History in 1853. And at its beginning, it was conceived of um, as a, a um, as a partnership, very much like the South Kensington Museum in 1857 in London between science and art, but increasingly uh, there was a divorce between the two and the courses taught um, at Oxford within the museum. As well as remaining friends, um, Ruskin supported Ackland on his art, and Ackland provided a sounding board to Ruskin during his increasing disillusion with religion as a result, um, amongst other things, scientific discoveries and the development um, theories around geology and the history of the earth. Famous quotation about those dreadful hammers. I hear the clink of them at the end of every cadence of the Bible verses was in a letter to Ackland. Um, despite Ruskin's use um, of these um, and his um, exchange, not just of letters, but of drawings as part of a dialogue about forms of seeing and forms of representing, uh, 
clouds and other um, cloudscape landscapes uh, with scientists uh, in London. Uh, Ruskin was increasingly critical of scientists whose technologies, in his view, enabled them to examine the skies while employing their ingenuity to extinguish the sun by poisoning the air and darkening its rays. However, and um, this is a beautiful, beautiful lecture diagram in our collection, Ruskin didn't deny the effectiveness of some optical technologies for enhancing the field of observation and understanding structure and form. So although he describes the microscope, for example, as a tormenting aid, in the elements of drawing, he explains to his students the value of a microscope, for example, to look at the structure of a bird's feathers. Quote, the separate scylla of the down, mechanisms at the joints, which no eye or lens can trace. However, as with the daguerreotype, again, Ruskin criticizes the effects of hyperreal detail and the separation of sight from sensory perception. Now, it wasn't only um, the, uh, the artists or artists like Ruskin who um, uh, were, were critical or felt were um, some of these technologies were detrimental uh, to what they were trying to achieve. Um, there's a very interesting uh, body of work in the Royal Society by Charles Piazzi Smith, who was Astronomer Royal for Scotland, and who was the earliest, one of the earliest proponents of um, the documentation of science, in this case, 19th century astronomy through photography. This um, watercolor depicts, quote, the cloud horizon at Gujara as seen by moonlight, showing the summit of the Grand Canary above the clouds in the distance, and shows how uh, scientific research at this time was also using more traditional forms of visual documentation. This particular watercolor features at the bottom half of a plate in Smith's paper, Astronomical, Astronomical Experiment on the Peak of Tenerife, carried out under the sanction of the Lords Commissioners of the Admiralty, published in the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society in 1848. It was a record of a research trip, astronomical expedition to a volcanic mountain ridge in Tenerife. And Smith writes, very like uh, Ruskin, telescopes cannot be so formed as to take away that confusion of rays which arises from the tremors of the atmosphere. The only remedy is a most serene and quiet air, such as may perhaps be found at the top of the highest mountains above the grosser clouds. Smith also published in his, re his results in a book, Tenerife, an Astronomer's Experiment, 1858, which is in Ruskin's um, own library collection with detailed um, annotations. Um, this book um, is rather wonderfully subtitled, Specialties of a Residence Above the Clouds. Um, it's the first ever book published using photo stereographs and using photography as well as painting uh, as a record uh, of a scientific research trip. Um, obviously, um, oh, thinking about uh, innovative forms of publication, one of the uh, other things we have in the collection and uh, we found more of these which hadn't been accessioned or catalogued when we packed up are these wood blocks for the illustration of um, uh, modern painters uh, in, given, as you can see, um, by the publisher. Now, um, just um, to finish, I wanted to uh, talk about two other aspects, uh, one 
very well known, obviously, about Ruskin's interest in science. And this, of course, is in the uh, very uh, popular fascination with earth sciences in the 19th century, the field, a new field of geology and its influence on the development of landscape painting. Um, this is um, a page from one of Ruskin's diary notebooks illustrating uh, geological strata. Ruskin was a regular visitor to the Alps and his many mountain artworks include some of the earliest photographic descriptions of Mont Blanc, but many, many uh, geological sections um, through, through the mountain strata. He was initially inspired by his intention to prove a scientifically accurate paintings of mountains by Turner, but he continued to extend the uses of science in this way to art throughout his career. He was well read across the fields of materialist science. He met and corresponded with the most preeminent geologists of the time, including Lyle, Buckland, and of course Darwin, who came back from the voyage of the Beadle, where he'd been the ship's geologist, uh, to lecture, and Ruskin spent the evening with him, meeting him again at his own home in the in um, Brant at Brantwood in the Lake District and in Oxford with his tutor, the geologist um, Buckland. Despite um, mutual respect between the two men, Ruskin couldn't accept, wouldn't accept Darwin's theories of evolution. And he writes, um, and we have um, again found amongst the lecture diagrams, more material relating to this um, dialogue between the two. If I had Darwin in Oxford for a week, and he was, he, Ruskin was professor of art at the time, and could force him to copy a feather, his notions of feathers would be changed for the rest of his life. But his ignorance of good art is no excuse for the accurate illogical simplicity of, his, of the rest of his talk of colour in The Descent of Man. Now here in our, um, in the collection, there are um, a lot of um, sections of this kind. And um, there are also um, a number of mountain drawings, which Ruskin describes as, and this is on the back of uh, this drawing, Ruskin says, my mountain drawings are absolutely correct with all that is useful for geological science or landscape art. Elsewhere, he writes, you'll never love art well until you love what she mirrors better, remaining firm in this belief that the experience of moving from detail to detail through the experience of observing a, a mountain landscape combined with an understanding of new scientific laws would underscore a religious apprehension of nature and the grand design of the universe. Ruskin followed in Turner's footsteps through the Alps, painting many of the same uh, mountains as, as Turner. And as with Turner, many of his paintings and sketches were not intended uh, for public display. Um, here we have two of the um, stunning uh, mineral collections um, from Brantwood um, and reminding us that this is uh, agate uh, from the collection, that the 19th century was an age of collectors as well as explorers and the transformation of the world through geopolitical and technical, technological expansion led to a new range of objects in museums and a new um, series of um, explorations of natural science relating to the fabric of the earth. Um, Ruskin's drawings about um, geology and about mountain landscapes are pre-fractal. He argued a stone was a mountain in miniature that landscape analysis should begin with diligent study 
of um, and drawings of rocks and stones, the materials of mountains. And along with many of the contemporary scientists with which he corresponded was a keen alpinist himself. Um, James David Forbes, who published Travels of the Alps, met and uh, corresponded with Ruskin, um, became, and we've been looking at um, that correspondence in the context of, again, some of the new material that is in Edinburgh relating to correspondence with Lyle, was part of a debate between um, a debate at the time of the understanding of the structure and movement of glaciers. So on the one hand, the, the idea that ice, though apparently brittle, behaves as a viscous subject when it's subjected to pressure, which was John Tyndall's view, um, Forbes's view, whereas John Tyndall um, proposed that glacier motion was a combination of fracture and relegation. This great glacier controversy is uh, played out, debated in Ruskin's Modern Painters, where he sided with Forbes. And here um, we have this very beautiful watercolor key that Ruskin developed for the geological diaries in his rock book, as he called it on the cover, where he's um, exploring these theories of the glacier amongst other things. And this notebook contains his uh, translations of Bernard Studer's Geology of Switzerland, historical notes and geological diagrams. In the 1840s and 50s, Ruskin's theories of geology and art appeared in popular periodicals dubbed artistical geology. For example, the 1846 annual report of the American Art Union noted, the landscape painter will be required to give his landscapes a geological and botanical character. He must so represent nature that the quality of the earth may be recognized, the classes of cloud formation of rock, the anatomy and drapery of trees, plants, and shrubs. This uh, painting by Ruskin of the Mer de Glace, uh, Chamonix, um, is recorded in his diary, 1849, amongst many of ascents onto the glaciers around Chamonix. Uh, Ruskin argued that artists should look for what he called leading lines in the landscapes, and you can see them here in the peaks, to depict their forms. He regularly compared these rock features to larger mountain forms. And in many ways, his depictions of the materials of mountains resemble a kind of artistic geology primer. I'm just going to um, move quickly through this to get to clouds. But here we have um, Forbes's, uh, the Scottish physicist Forbes, a uh, page from his notebook on the viscous theory of glacial uh, motion. He traveled regularly to the Alps. He met with Ruskin. Ruskin called him a fellow workman, uh, noting the only member of the geology, geological society who could draw a mountain. And for Forbes, Ruskin was a willing and courageous advocate of his theory during the so-called hostile great glacier con controversy uh, in science about the movement of the glaciers. In Ruskin's view, I quote, 20 years of useless debate and senseless theory regarding glacier motion might have been spared us if other scientists, quote, had been able to draw accurately a single curve of a mountain crest, a glacier wave, a river's bank, or a fish's tail. And again, this uh, emphasis on um, modes of understanding through visual cognition and representation. So here we have more um, Aguil um, mountain peaks and this beautiful drawing in the collection um, 
free, free flowing drawing of a glacier scape. So um, clouds, um, meteorology for Ruskin um, appealed to him as what he called a science of pure air and the bright heaven. Like the painters Constable and Turner before him, Ruskin depended on the scientist Luke Howard's classification of cloud types. Ruskin was fascinated from cloud, with clouds since childhood, and he often painted using a cyanometer, a device for measuring the color blue, created by de Saussure, um, in, created by de Saussure. Ruskin um, often used meteorological uh, imagery to counter his scientific adversaries and offered powerful critiques of the adverse effects of industrialization. So, for example, John Tyndall's experiment on atmospheric scattering, or why the sky is blue, is satirized in Ruskin's modern painters. And Huxley, Thomas Henry Huxley, comes under fire in The Queen of the Air in 1869. By 1870, in Ruskin's famous storm cloud of the 19th century lecture, Ruskin had become convinced that the sky was being dimmed by, I quote, a veil of pollution from industry. He concludes, you may be pretty sure that scientific people don't know much yet about either rock beds or clouds. Um, here is Fitzroy based on Howard's weather book. And very interesting to see the similarity and to compare with uh, many of Ruskin's um, cloud drawings. And um, these are um, Fitzroy's weather book cloud classifications as well in uh, painted form. Ruskin corresponded about these and annotated again his copy in his library referring to his own works. This is one of Ruskin's um, cloudscapes, Light in the West, which became uh, plate 66 of modern painters in which he says, um, developing his argument on the law of perspectives for clouds, reflecting of course, that clouds won't wait while we draw them. Quote, you must try to draw sketch at the utmost speed, the whole range of clouds, marking by any short, shorthand or symbolic work, the peculiar character of each. So to conclude, um, this image is the mirror image of the Mer de Glace, which is the title image of the lecture. In June 2018, 164 years after Ruskin created that iconic daguerreotype, Emma Stibben captured the same view using another early photographic process, the cyanotype. Of course, Emma's image documents the extent of glacier retreat, demonstrating the impact of human activity on the glaciated landscape. Emma's works on paper dramatize in a different way from Ruskin's, but in dialogue with him, the effects of human intervention and natural phenomena on monumental structures, exploring the fragility of existence. Ruskin recognized that he was living through a time of unprecedented scientific, environmental, and technological change. The grass of the field, his drawing of a delicate shaft of wheat transformed into metal, imagines a post-industrial world in which the iron has grown directly from the earth. Ruskin became deeply illusioned through his experience of modern industrial civilization. Future ages will hate this age for its scientific accomplishment, he concluded. We have lost the art of painting on glass and invented gun, cotton and nitroglycerin. While increasingly out of step with his contemporaries, Ruskin's concern for environmental issues and the impact of new technologies on the health of the planet speak powerfully to our own era. Quote from cloud, storm clouds, blanched sun, blighted grass, blinded man. 
He used scientific techniques to refine artistic observation of the natural world and to bring to bear an artistic gaze on scientific understanding of the environment. Today, as we confront the scale of human agency in changing the Earth's environment, Ruskin's meticulous approach to communicating and witnessing transformation within the natural world and understanding the principles of life from this seem prescient and pertinent. In his review of um, the uh, Unto This Last exhibition at the Yale Center for British Art uh, in the bicentenary of Ruskin's work, Vernon Klinkenberg, critic um, and archivist wrote, the 19th century was rich in presiding intellects, but after the publication of the first volume of Modern Painters in 1843, it had only one nervous system, and that was Ruskin's. It seems to me, in light of the uh, resonance and relevance of uh, Ruskin's work around understanding the relationship uh, between humans and the environment and uh, stewardship of the world around them, that that um, nervous system and presiding intellect is equally relevant today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sandra. That was such a rich paper, both visually and in, in, in the ideas and thoughts that, that, that um, accompany that there's a particular treat to see so many of the new objects that have been unearthed in the chaotic move and 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 um, renovation in the Ruskin at the moment. So thank you for sharing those with all with us as well. We hope to see a lot more of those um, published and cataloged and 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 uh, available for us to see when 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 things get back to normal. Um, there's so many questions I could could ask about this. I'll I'll keep myself to a couple and I'll throw it open to everyone else. Um, I was really struck by that slide of Delarue's um, heliograph, the, 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 the photograph of the sun, which, which was then hand colored and, and so beautifully hand colored. And it struck me as being precisely what Ruskin might have meant by painting with sunlight. Um, and and you, you come back to this at the end, I think a little bit with Fitzroy's cloud illustrations, but I, I wonder if you could say a little bit more. I mean, Ruskin often seems so unfair in the way he talks about science, but um, to what extent do you think his own sensibility, his own ability to see and to record what he sees is itself a product of, of, of his study of scientific illustration and of, of absorbing the, the, the culture, the Victorian culture of scientific illustration. So that's, that's, that's my first question. My second, I'll, I'll just give you to them both. Um, you said it towards the beginning about Ruskin's concern about the divorce between science and religion. And as we all know, sci as a religious person, Ruskin was pretty unorthodox and um, uh, idiosyncratic. So, you know, you gave us some wonderful little quotes, some of which came up in the chat as well, about the inner life of clouds, um, this, this wonderful way in which Ruskin described his own sketches as a new piece of a living thing. Um, and it seems to me so much of what Ruskin's critique of science is, is that it is de-organifying nature. It is draining it of its vitality and of its life. Is that, is, is studying the, the, the kind of way in which Ruskin criticizes nature a path into what Ruskin's own religiosity is? Is, is, he, is he giving us glimpses here of, it's not really Christian, it's not really, um, it's certainly not evangelical. It's it's not really a Victorian Christianity in any way whatsoever. So how is his own religiosity perhaps being formed by the ways in which he wants to critique science? Um, thank you. Um, so in relation to the first question, um, and I, I see Emma is here, who um, did a wonderful a blog on Ruskin and Forbes, so it'd be really interesting to hear from Emma. Um, but um, 
My, I, I have been uh, astonished by um, the richness of the exchange, which I guess because it hasn't um, been looked at, because it hasn't been available before, of um, the and because at the Royal Society, for example, in the collection in in the research on the collection there. Um, it, it also hasn't been available. Looking at, um, there is, there's far more work and exchange, far more work to be done, but really wonderful uh, alignment of scientific notebooks with Ruskin's notebooks. And I think my answer would be, I think it is much more deeply informed than um, Ruskin acknowledges or has been available for us to see. But where I think um, Ruskin leads in many ways is that from what I can see, the scientists, and, and it's so beautiful, these notebooks where there are the watercolors from the astronomical trips and then the photographs as well. But Ruskin was interested in, in this to push, constantly push the boundaries of, of illustration in his own publications. And I think that's, um, so partly he's interested in it for his understanding of, of um, the world, but a lot of it, I think, is he's constantly, this, this, this balance between, um, and the constant contradictions in his work between saying, well, you don't need to know all that stuff, but maybe you do, is, is to get the best possible uh, published publication technologies in terms of precision of detail, colour and accurate representation. So, I, so the answer is yes. And I think very often, as ever with Ruskin, it's not truly interdisciplinary. He takes the bits he likes and he leaves the bits he doesn't. I think there's, and but I do think um, there's far, I, I'm most interested by the annotations in the marginalia of the books um, to see how much more he engaged with those debates than we know. So I, I think that would be my answer to the first question. And um, they, are, they are engaging at the level of the accuracy of the colour charts, for example, for the geological strata or for the sun strata, how they could be reproduced in print in the earliest age of colour print, for example. So I think communication technologies and print technologies are common across the two. In, in terms of the divorce and science of science and religion, I, I think that what is so compelling about Ruskin's um, both writings and visual works is the way he manages to combine the most profound experience of what it means to be human with a sense of transcendence. And I think great musicians do it as well. But I think he moves, you know, in other forms of art. I think it's, um, I, I think it's, it's transcendental um, and it's not conventional and it's often ricochets into very dark places but I think it's there throughout the works. And it's one of the things that in these little thought pieces or sketches, you capture moments of joy, actually, that are profoundly um, true in a kind of spiritual sense. With that, I think we, uh, we will be forced to leave this transformative discussion today. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, Sandra, for your splendid presentation for this feast, visual yeah. and, and intellectual feast. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, one thing we didn't talk about for giving us a sense of the innovative vision behind the, uh, behind the Ruskin at Lancaster University and the, the whole notion of the museum of the near future. Um, 
one thing I thought I would I would note here, um, there, there are various projects that Sandra and the museum are engaged on in, in, in areas of preserving uh, the, the collection, preserving aspects of the collection, uh, to, to preserve and to showcase this unique and comprehensive collection. So um, if you're interested, uh, both find out about what the various projects of the, um, of the Ruskin, uh, but also if you're interested in donating or supporting uh, their, uh, their efforts, uh, please uh, 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 take a look at their website, www.lancaster.ac.uk slash the Ruskin. Uh, that's also available on our, our website, so you can go there if I move too quickly, www.lancaster.ac.uk slash the Ruskin. And there's a support tab there that you will find with information about the various uh, projects. I'd also like to thank Robert for joining us today from, from Notre Dame. Um, we will be live streaming the uh, Notre Dame second annual Ruskin lecture next February, February 8th on Ruskin's birthday and details to come. So more contacts uh, with Robert in the future. Gabe, Gabe, I so I and say Gabriel is too modest to um, note that he is the the key the, the so. <laughs> yes. which which reminds me I need to, I need to work on that lecture. <laughs> Thank you, Robert. Um, I had mentioned that this is the last lecture in our spring season. We will be dark in July, but back in August, celebrating uh, uh, someone who has a great deal to do with the with the Ruskin at Lancaster University celebrating the long and fruitful career of the man who shepherded, shepherded the, uh, the White House collection to Lancaster University, the Ruskin scholar, James Dearden. So on Saturday, August 14th, on the occasion of Jim's 90th birthday, the uh, new Ruskin Society of North America in collaboration with the Ruskin Art Club will present the first um, uh, RN, uh, RSNA Award for Lifetime Achievement in Ruskin Studies to James Dearden. So that will be again Saturday, August 14th, time 5 p.m. Um, uh, it will be 5 p.m. Uh, uh, British Standard Time, so that's 9 a.m. in the morning Pacific Daylight Time, but all, uh, we'll, we'll have more information about all that to come. There will be a filmed interview with Jim conducted by Howard Hull, the director of Brantwood, along with testimonials from Jim's colleagues in the world of Ruskin scholarship. Uh, our Ruskin Art Club fall and winter season begins as it always does with our annual Ruskin lecture, the 21st annual Ruskin lecture, co-sponsored by the Doheny Library at USC on Thursday, September 9th at 5 p.m. It will be given this year another fruit, fruitful uh, uh, contact from our Notre Dame conference in 2020. It will be given this year by Dr. Frederick Alberton Johnson from the University of Chicago uh, on the theme, The Green Victorians and the Vision of the Sufficient Life. And Dr. Johnson is going to be reflecting both on the incredible group of Ruskinians in the Lake District uh, at the end of the 19th century and their attempts to translate Ruskin's ideas into a practical way of life and then reflect on some of their experience in terms of our own post-COVID uh, world and our uh, embrace of an ecologically responsible lifestyle. Details on this and other upcoming events on our website, www.ruskinartclub org with membership information, Ruskin resources galore, and our YouTube channel archive of all of our presentations. Uh, this lecture will join that, that archive uh, shortly. Also this summer, look for the newsletter. We'll be sending out one in a week or so. Uh, Katrina had to leave, but I want to thank Katrina for her technical help this morning. Uh, and again, to Sandra for a a, a marvelous presentation Fantastic. and for Robert for joining us as well. Um, so have a great July, have a great summer. 
and we'll see you in August. Bye. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.